Welcome to See You on the Other Side, where the world of the mysterious collides with the world of entertainment. A discussion of art, music, movies, spirituality, the weird, and self-discovery. And now, your hosts, musicians and entertainers who have their own weakness for the weird, Mike and Wendy from the band Sunspot. Oh, I'm looking over your shoulder, Wendy, and it looks like blue skies behind you. It is blue skies. It is sunny and warm. (laughs) And so obviously I'm not in Wisconsin. (laughs) No. So it looks like you really are in the middle of the desert. I really am in the middle of the desert. desert. Okay, (laughs) But thankfully there's internet here, so all is well. All right. Well, that that sounds like fun. Well, anyway, it, it's pretty to look behind you and see all the blue. And behind well, me, you just you. you just see gray because Wisconsin this week decided to become uh, Seattle for the week. Dang, it was bummer. Yeah, April Fool's Day decided to dress up like Seattle. Well, I thought for the arrival of spring that it would be a little bit nicer by now. So I'm in Arizona. AZ which, again. We're we're doing the cross time zone <laughs> conversation. Oh yeah. Here. But hopefully by the time I get back, you'll have it all warm and nice there for me, right? I'm working on it. Springy? Today I'm actually working on the, I'm seeding the clouds or unseeding the clouds as it were. I'm using some of that harp weather control technology to see if we can uh, make it a little bit nicer here. All right. But you know, we're, we're talking about the changing of the seasons. We're talking about life going on. And I tell you it's nothing like all of these anniversaries to start popping up that start making me feel old. <laughs> okay. Anniversaries well, okay. of events you're well, talking about. Yeah. And the first is, um, so Allison this week is going to go visit. They're, they're having a special 20th anniversary uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer event. Oh, wow. That is hard to believe. At Marquette University in Milwaukee. Cool. So, that sounds fun. Yeah. So the idea that Buffy the Vampire Slayer, not the original movie, but the, the show with... Um, Sarah Michelle Gellar. Sarah Michelle Gellar yes. and Buffy. Seth Green, David Boreas. Anyway, everybody very remembers Buffy. A very a attractive big, cast on that one. Yeah, it was a good looking cast. And that red haired... Oh, I can't... Allison Hannigan. That's who I'm thinking of. The girl from... Uh, the one time at band camp girl from American Pie. Oh, isn't she on uh, How I Met Your Mother? I believe she is on How I Met Your Mother. So She's still around, still doing yes, stuff. Yes, and I, cool. I, believe, I think she was a werewolf on Buffy the Vampire Slayer. <laughs> anyway, I used to watch, but I, did, I wasn't a hardcore fan of Buffy. Like, I liked it, uh-huh. but it wasn't something I came back to and watched it. I, I liked it when I watched it. Yeah, I thought it was fun, too. I wasn't, like, a hardcore fan, but uh, I would tune in every now and then. Yeah, and it was pretty fun. I know that some of our friends, like... Still have a crush on Spike, oh James gosh. Marsters, that naughty vampire. <laughs> oh, the bad boy. Yeah. Always got to go for the bad boy. But I just think it's funny. The 20th, so Buffy the Vampire Slayer, 20th anniversary um, is coming. And that was the first thing we're like, oh my God, like Buffy's already 20 years old. Yeah. And I thought it was weird when, you know, I was like, oh, the X-Files. I mean, the X-Files is going to be 25 next year. Oh. It, right. So yeah. just these cultural touchstones where you're all of a sudden like, oh man, I can't believe that was 20 years ago. And there's one thing that I really can't believe was 20 years ago. And this one, um, well, this is why one of the reasons we're having our episode today is the Suicide of the Heaven's Gate cult members uh, is 20 years yes. ago, this week. Now, Wendy, do you remember, I guess I remember very clearly where I was when I heard about it. I don't remember specifically where I was. I remember it being in college, and I remember people giving me a lot of grief about it because at the time, I had a side job doing webmastering. Yes. So people were like, oh, did you hear about that cult of webmasters? Right. And uh, that was how I first, I was like, well, what are you talking about? And then, you know, of course, it was huge on the news and everything like that. But, but you remember where you were, obviously. Well, I was, I was sitting in my dorm room. Mm-hmm. In March of 1997, sitting in the dorm room, Celery Hall, sixth floor, six, 670. What a, what, a, what, a, what a great dorm room that was. Anyway. At UW-Madison. At UW-Madison. I think I was smoking, because at the time you could smoke inside the things. I was like, <laughs> right, you could oh, smoke gosh. inside the dorm. So I'm probably having a cigarette, and probably because I was living very healthy in 1997. That's right. Celery was a smoking dorm. Yeah. So I think I was smoking. I was drinking a Coke, like a full full dude. all corn syrup <laughs> you know kind of thing. Sugar. like i think about that today you'd be like every time you're like well i have a coke i feel guilty i used to have like five a day so i'm having a coke oh. having a smoke and i'm looking i'm reading my news on the internet and i'm already feeling like i'm living in the future because i'm reading my news on the internet 
Yeah, that's pretty awesome. And, uh, and it, you know, and you just thought it was a replay of what happened in Jonestown in, in 1977, where all those like yeah. the 700 people died. But um, I remember just reading that and then immediately going to the Heaven's Gate website. Of course, as you do. Because they had this link, because it was the, and, and we'll get more a little bit into the, the history of it, but they had their own site. And the, and the site, the website is still up, heavensgate.com. You guys can go to it whenever you want. You can read their entire manifesto. Oh the whole thing, you can read on the Heaven's Gate website. And just to remind everybody, I mean, especially the younger folk, <laughs> gosh, that sounds terrible. But, um, you know, in 1997, the internet was still relatively new, and especially web pages and the surfable internet. Like, you know, we were still using Netscape to search for things and um, so that's why being a webmaster, as they called it, like that was kind of a, a newer <laughs> <laughs> occupation. But uh, yeah, so these websites weren't very graphical. They were a lot of text and a lot of really ugly animated GIFs, if you're lucky. <laughs> well, okay. And and the Heaven's Gate website is an animated animated GIF. I'm looking <laughs> at the t- top right now. There's this red alert. It says red alert. It's coming like on the top of the screen, like coming from the back, like red, red alert. And it's got a starry background. Like it's a GeoCities Pixelated. site or something. Yeah. Yeah, just like little dots, stars. And the top line says, red alert, hail bop brings closure to heaven's gate. Wow. And, it, and it's got this graphic, you know, 1990s style. It, and it, it's like this, it's, there's, there's earth and there's a comet. And then there's the heaven's gate, as was promised. The keys to heaven's gate are here again in T and Doe, the UFO 2 we're in Jesus and his father 2,000 years ago. Okay, so let's unpack that real quick. Number one, the G in Heaven's Gate is straight out of the Green Bay Packer logo. <laughs> so, so they were sports ball fans. They're obviously, okay. Heaven's Gate were Green Bay Packer fans. They were big. <laughs> and they were athletic. I mean, they, they did have uh, trainers on. Yeah. So number one, it's this old school website, and it's still up after 20 years after and- the... Go ahead. It's surprising that they don't, I mean, somebody's obviously paying to maintain it, to keep it on the server, to keep the domain name registered. So it's kind of surprising that they don't have some sort of a, like, a memorial or a, a little preface to say, like, here's the page as it was, you know, when it happened. It's just left there, like an old artifact, a modern day artifact of zeros and ones. It's former members who still keep it up. Oh, okay. Because they still want to spread the message of Heaven's wow. Gate. And just to start talking about it, and, and we'll, we'll get more into the, the former members and the people that didn't perish in 1997, the people that didn't kill themselves. But, I mean, starting out, first of all, Heaven's Gate starts in the 1970s, where, Wendy, you and I both know all good things begin in the 1970s. It's a great decade. I mean, yeah. <laughs> right. Good things came out of that decade. Yes. <laughs> but you got the son of this Presbyterian minister, Marshall Applewhite, and he is in the late 60s and early 70s. He's a music teacher. Oh. So he's a music teacher at a local college, but then he gets in trouble for having a relationship with one of his students. Mm. Okay. So mm-hmm. he, he has a homosexual relationship with one of his students, and it's, it's the South. He's a religious guy. He's asked to leave the college. Okay. And he ends up meeting this woman so it's marshall applewhite and bonnie nettles and they meet up in the 1970s and so bonnie is really into astrology and fortune telling she's religious she's baptist but she's also really into astrology and fortune telling and she has seances and says that she can contact spirits and then she meets up with marshall applewhite and she does a okay. like an astrological casting like, you know, we had our astrologer on last year who <laughs> predicted the Donald Trump presidency. So he, I can't make fun of astrology anymore because that guy was right. But she says that their stars are aligned. Okay. She says to Marshall that, you know, they are meant to work together to form something. And so then they start talking and they, they come up with this cosmology and they start recruiting members into their organization. And so let me tell you what their flyers used to say. So they would put up flyers and they would hold little lectures and the flyers would say, UFOs, why are they here? Who have they come for when they will leave? So 
they're presenting this to people as, okay, if I saw that flyer, like say come seven o'clock tonight at the Coal Center, there's going to be a presentation and the UFOs, why are they here? Who have they come for? And when are they going to leave? Of course they're going to go. I'm going. Right. Yeah. I'm there too. <laughs> that sounds <laughs> right. fun. Right. And they, and they start doing this in different towns, but they do this. And it's funny because uh, in 1975, they even made the news when they did this in a town in Oregon. They did this in Waldman, Oregon. And it's a small town. They hold this presentation and then 20 people end up going with them to their next place. And so like it's moving, relocating, relocating, like wow, going to travel big, with, with convincing. the Heaven's Gate. Yeah. And so they held the presentation and they take off. And then it even made the news because it was like 3% of the town ended up going with them. Wow. To their next, their next thing was in Colorado, but also people didn't, this was before the internet, before they had the schedules up and stuff. So people didn't know. So it was just, it made the news like Walter Cronkite was talking about how these people from the town disappeared and they kind of made the joke of like, well, was it the UFOs that took them? Oh man. And this is back in 1975. So this is, you know, 22 years before they made the, the big news for their, yeah. So this is just the very beginning. They were kind of shaking up places and people. Yep. yep. And they were going to meet uh, and recruit new people. And in the 70s, that kind of stuff worked. Yeah. And it's funny, when you watch the, the ex-members talk about why they joined up, it was spiritually minded people who, like the message made more sense to them than the traditional religious message. Because... Number one, they, they nicknamed, they had different nicknames for themselves. So Applewhite and Nettles had different nicknames. So they started with Guinea and Pig, which I'm, I'm glad they changed it. And the next one was like Bo and Peep. And eventually they stopped the cutesy business and it just became, <laughs> right, Guinea and Pig, Bo and Peep. And eventually they just became T and Doe. She, uh, that's not cutesy? Seriously? D- I don't get it. So a deer, a female deer. Oh, no. I, I, okay, I didn't even... I guess I didn't even think of the sound of music part of it. <laughs> wow, okay, there you go. So to me, that seemed less... But the music cute, teacher. Cute. Oh, I guess it makes sense. yeah, the scale, of course. The scale. Right, yeah. he was a music teacher and... <laughs> Ray, a drop of golden sun. <laughs> and of course he's going to like musicals. Oh, p- p- okay. D- Doe and... So T and Doe. They formed the, what's called the UFO 2. And the idea was that um, they were no longer their human selves. They were receptacles for this knowledge. They were receptacles for this extraterrestrial knowledge. And okay, so psychic, psychic knowledge? Yes. So they were receiving this psychic knowledge from the extraterrestrials out there, God. And God came through Doe. I'm sorry, God came through T, the father. And Jesus came through Doe, the son. And they said that these were the present receptacles of those particular aliens. And the reason people, you know, if you're a religious person, and not saying, when somebody says they're Jesus, like that, that, that's the basis of like half. <laughs> that's that, a that, pretty like, big claim. The, the Branch Davidians did the same thing. Like, you know, he's like, well, I'm a reincarnation of Jesus. David Koresh said that. Yeah. But it was the fact that they brought the aliens into the religion that people seemed to glom onto. So when they were saying that, you know, the Virgin Mary, it wasn't a virgin birth, but actually yeah. she was taken up into a spaceship, impregnated, brought back down to earth, and that Jesus was a receptacle of extraterrestrial intelligence. That does seem, if you're going to buy into the whole thing, that does seem a little more realistic, quote unquote realistic, than saying that, okay, well, God touched her on the head. An angel came to her, God touched her on the head, and all of a sudden she had a baby. Well, also considering the audience and the time you know, the seventies, yeah, eighties, whatever, you know, people are looking for something. It's, it's a more modern philosophy. It's something really out there and different, you know, which back then was fashionable. Right. Right. But also the fact that, I mean, most of us, except the diehard skeptics, most of us do believe that there's probably aliens that live somewhere. Maybe they haven't visited earth, but we all think yeah. that extraterrestrials are real because it seems almost impossible. There that, has to be something. Yeah. yeah. Statistically. The, the universe is damn near infinite, and you're telling me there's no, but, you know, there's no other life out there? Of course there's going to be some other life out there. It has to be. The odds are more in favor of it existing than in not existing. So right. if, if you're a gambling man, and I am, <laughs> then you would gamble <laughs> on the existence of aliens. 
And also, people have been watching sci-fi stuff about aliens since they were kids. You know, I would say that between people we know, if you would say to somebody, well, do you think aliens are real versus do you believe that Jesus is real? They'd probably say like, well, I believe in aliens, a better chance of aliens. But here's the thing. When you take chocolate and peanut butter and put it together, you get two great tastes that taste great together and you get aliens Mm. in Jesus. Now you're making me hungry. Yep, now I'm making you hungry for alien Jesus. I understand. We all want a little bit of that faith. But, I mean, they, they have that. So they are bringing on, they're combining Christianity with science fiction, with, like, the New Age spirituality. So some of these people that joined up had already been living in communes in, like, the 1960s. So they've already tried alternative lifestyles. And, and their minds are open to new and different kinds of philosophies. Yes. And this was definitely... A different kind of philosophy. Um, (laughs) But not that dissimilar. So when we start getting into, when the people were talking about what actually uh, the Heaven's Gate people believed and what they were doing, they weren't living that differently than like a monk would live or a priest would live. Like number one rule was no sex. Okay. Okay. So that was just like a monk or a nun or a priest, celibacy was one of the biggest things. Yeah, that's pretty standard. And so, you know, if you would say to somebody, like, well, it's weird you're not, you know, interested in doing it. Well, a monk would be like, well, I have more holy pursuits than the physical. And, and that's the thing what Heaven's Gate was talking about. They were trying to get people to what they would call the level above human. Okay, so it was... More all, human than human? More human than human. So Rob Zombie was secretly Heaven's Gate. (laughs) But the level above human where there's no gender and no emotion. So they take that little bit from the Vulcans in Star Trek where you're more evolved if you don't have these uh, impulses of emotion and losing self-control. Right. And then you don't have a gender because the soul doesn't have a gender. Okay. So, you know, when you think about reincarnation, as I often do. Mm-hmm. So in reincarnation, you know, people are like, would come back, they'd say like, well, in my past life, I was a woman, my past life, I was, you know, I've been a woman and a man differently uh, over the course of millennia. And so it wouldn't be weird if you said, well, of course, the soul doesn't have a gender. So they're taking that aspect of the new age reincarnation, Eastern mysticism, and also bringing that into it. When, at the level of, and this is one of the reasons they dressed the way they did, because they would not dress in a way that would differentiate a man and a woman. Okay, so what was the uniform for the Heaven's Gate cult? Well, or group religion. Well, the he- right, sure. It. We can. No, we, it's okay. They call, they called themselves a cult, actually. Okay. And, <laughs> okay, so I'm not going to offend anybody. No, and one of the reasons they called themselves a cult, and and this is funny because they were very frank about things. They'd be like, "Well, yes, of course we're a cult, but you know who is the original cult?" And they talk about Jesus and his twelve disciples. Okay. So that was the and they're Fair like, "Well, enough. that's the original cult," and then. You know, they wouldn't talk about it like suicide. They say, of course, suicide's the worst possible thing you can do. They're like, we love our bodies. We love life. That's why we want to go to the next level. So all the talking about things is very frank. All the sexual talk is very, I mean, not, it's not like dirty talk or not like, yeah, but it, it's just very frank. Practical. Dis- yeah, discussions of the stuff. And you keep hearing the people talk about this in the different documentaries and interviews with the ex-members, because this is why some of the ex-members left. And it was because they couldn't control their sexual impulses. And so they felt guilty all the time. Because mm. that was the big one, was trying to control your sexual impulse. Even whether it be for another person or for yourself or for whatever, they would always be <laughs> trying to keep that under control. And they'd feel like they failed and they weren't good enough because that was the hardest thing to control, that celibacy. Mm. And that was a big part of the Heaven's Gate cult because the whole idea was to get to the level above human, you have to beat human impulses. Yeah. Okay? That's tricky. Discipline. Well, of Self course. Dip- self-discipline. <laughs> is the trickiest. So breaking away means that you become a different individual full of next level information. And the idea was you, once you could separate yourself from your human impulses and your lack of self-control, that your old life, would you break away from it. And, and the human mind, and then you would learn the truth, the, the next level, the higher level, where you didn't have those physical impulses and those physical needs. And I got to say, you know, we're talking about cultists. We're talking about people who live in crazy town. 
that's not that much different than any other kind of religion and control and sin and you know um the old testament with its like ton of rules about eating kosher and and um yeah. onanism and the whole you know that entire thing is all about finding ways to self control and so heaven's gate still it's still tracking on the fairly normal level I, I guess UFOs is not <laughs> never is going to track on any normal level, but uh, for religions, it still isn't that wacky, right? And I mean, when you consider that traditional religion, all the miracles and things that happened are outside of the the realm of standard, right? You know, belief. So UFOs aren't <laughs> that different. It's just no, a more modern <laughs> is it, philosophy. Is a UFO any different than talking about a guy that could multiply a bunch of fish and bread? And don't forget wine. I mean, Jesus knew how to have a good time. <laughs> that he's like, he turned water into wine, which he'd be the most popular guy on campus right? here if he could really do that. That's because, true. Because the underagers would always invite Jesus. Because like, guys, we don't need to fake. Well, we got Jesus. The whole entire Lake Mendota and Lake Monona would just be wine. <laughs> That's true. We'd just be swimming in it all wasted. So it, it's still not that weird. But uh, it does get like... You know, it's an interview, and some of these guys are trying to get castrated. Like, they want to be castrated, uh, so they no longer have the urge. The, yeah. Now, mm-hmm. does memory serve me right? The videos of the, the leader. Yes. Do. Where he had the big, bulging out eyes and kind of... He does. The look of someone... A little out there, maybe? I don't oh, know yeah. how to say it. <laughs> well, he's bald. But but you know what I'm talking about, where it looks like a parody almost? It doesn't look like an actual, like, this is serious? It does, well, it doesn't help that it's shot on video either. Anything, true, everything true. shot on video looks cheap. At least, we're talking about VHS video. When I'm talking about digital video, you can, I know you can make very believable yeah. movies on digital video. Don't get me wrong, the modern art form. But when we talk about stuff in the 1990s, stuff that was shot, shot on video, try to watch an old BBC science fiction show from the 1980s and tell me that doesn't look super cheap. And it, it, yeah. <laughs> it looks like a parody because it's shot on video. And there's like little special effects too. Like there's, uh, the, you know, those little like Amiga level special effects. Like the, it's like the local public access station. Yeah. We like, always have like whenever we'd go on there with our band, you know, it'd be like four screens of us flying around in circles. Mm-hmm. And, psychedelic rainbows behind us and bingo like you know a title comes flying up or something like you know and, and yeah. that's exactly how these heaven's gate videos work and so i spent a lot of the past couple of days watching these videos because i kind of <laughs> i wanted to learn more too because yeah. i assumed that i mean these guys were just crazy town and they believed in this you know insane comet was coming and they were going to get picked up by the ufo and fly off into space and they all killed themselves and it was very pressure filled and it was a situation like in jonestown in jonestown uh, and if you guys don't know what we're referring to we'll probably have to do an episode on jonestown sometime but jonestown was another cult where several hundred people died and committed a mass suicide and that was more force so that you know if you didn't agree to drink the Kool-Aid that's with a whole expression drinking the Kool-Aid, because they, they drank poison Kool-Aid. Um, that's where that expression comes from, is that, that Jonestown. Right. Like, everybody died at once. Like, it was very forced. Um, in the Heaven's Gate suicide, they all died over in, in waves. And in their manual, it even talks about how they're going to do it. Like, the first group goes, the, and then they're taken care of. You know, they put shrouds over their head and things like that. And then the next group goes, and then the next group goes, finally. So... It was a very strangely voluntary thing, and everybody was so convinced, and they wanted to go. And just to kind of talk about, like, some people would even volunteer to be castrated. They wanted to be castrated because they wanted to purify themselves. And one of the things that Marshall Applewhite would teach is that, you know, if your body is a vehicle for your soul, and it's only a vehicle, and it's that really separation of the physical and the spiritual, so because the physical's of a lower plane, the physicals of a lower level of evolution. And that's the idea, the sexual, the, the needs for food. You know, they didn't believe in, I mean, they would separate people who were formerly married and like live in different part of the complexes. Like once you were part of it, you were no longer married. You were no longer, you know, you were, you were part of the, wow. the group and no longer, um, you know, all those 
human connection. Social paradigms. Yeah, we're completely gone. So like, you know, one of the things that Marshall talks about in the video, he says, if your eye offends you, pluck it out, which is a Bible verse. What? Yeah, that, that, that's, that's a Bible verse saying, you know, the, uh. the things that tempt you. Get rid of the things that tempt you. And it's supposed to be shock. Literally. It, if it's your eye, then pluck it out. Well, these guys were saying that their junk was tempting them and that they wanted to get castrated. And one of the guys gets castrated. He's, they flip a coin to see who's going to do it. The guy that loses. Oh, no. They, they just did it themselves? Well, I don't know. How, he doesn't speak how they do it. So I don't know if they, they, I don't know if they cut the goods off. Please like, let there be a medical professional involved. <laughs> like Varys in Game of Thrones. <sighs> I don't know if it was chemicals. It might have been chemical too because they have chemical castration. Where it just, you know, takes your yeah. hormones. But the guy that lost the coin toss didn't get castrated. And he felt like he couldn't control himself, uh, his sexual urge. So then he left the cult. He left uh, the group. Because ooh. he was just like, well, that just wasn't, you know, I, I'm, it's not meant for me because I'm not as good as you people are because I can't go all the way. I can't be, you know, I can't be as spiritually clean. And they would, uh, enemas, so regular enemas for the group to keep that vehicle clean and also, uh, they would have this ma- called a master cleanser. What? From this 1970s book called Master Cleanse. Okay, mm. so you drink lemonade with cayenne pepper and maple syrup. Oh, right. Yes. And it's supposed to cleanse the body of toxins. But I think they would do that for like weeks. They would, that's all they'd have for weeks, is that, to make sure their body was as clean as possible. That would definitely affect how you think. I mean, if your brain isn't getting... <laughs> right, you're living on maple the syrup. it needs. Yeah. I say, you know... Lemonades with sugar, cayenne pepper, and maple syrup, more sugar. I mean, that kind of sounds like my diet in 1997. <laughs> well, I don't think it's like sweetened lemonade. I think it's actually like lemon Just squeeze juice. lemonade. Okay, th- yeah. that's the master cleanser. Like you don't just go by Minute Maid when you get the master cleanse. <laughs> I think. I mean, from what I've read about it. The idea, though, that, you know, your body, your physical impulses, your urges are not your spirit and that you need to clean that body and that that's not none of this sounds too crazy i mean none of it sounds too crazy yet like even you read uh be here now right a little eckhart tolle um i think I, the power of now the power of now that's what i'm thinking of yes yeah yeah, yeah he read the power of now so the power yeah. of now the whole idea is that you know you are not your body you are not your physical impulse that there's this there's this being inside you that lives without any of that kind of dirty stuff and so Dirty. all of this is fairly straight up new age. I mean, until the fact that people leave their family, until it separates them, you know, and then they're grabbing the stuff right out of science fiction. You know, you asked about the uniform before. So this is the uniform that they'd wear like a, it almost looks like a black, like karate outfit, like the top at least would oh, be okay. not necessarily a gi, but something like that, like a, like a, looks like a, you know, you're in a karate studio like top scrubs. black thicker than that okay almost sweatshirt like material but they wear that on top and then they'd have their nike decades for shoes which were black with that black shoes with a white strut of with the white swoosh well i'm pretty sure that they just did that because they could get a good deal on it (laughs) so they were thrifty (laughs) yes and it's funny because you know that's the one thing everybody remember you know besides hail we'll get more into hail bop in a second and we'll get more into the uh, the suicides in a second. But one of the things that people remember is the fact that everybody's wearing the same kind of Nike shoes. And so there's actually an article from a couple of years ago it, and, and from Reddit where the guy, a guy writes a story about when he met the person that sold them the Nike shoes. Oh, wow. And huh. how that guy, had, he talked to an older man. So he obviously talked to Marshall Applewhite, Doe. He talked to Doe a few days before. And... He was trying to see if he could get a good deal on like a certain kind of black and white sneaker. And he asked for like 39 pairs or whatever. And so the guy found him a deal and he said, oh, is this for a basketball team or something? To which, the, you know, Marshall Applewhite was like, yeah, yeah, something like that. Wow. And, <laughs> something like that. All right. Huh. Well, it's probably more the fact that they wanted to match and, and have the uniform you know, than the actual fact that they were Nikes. Although you'd think that they could find something a little more reasonably reasonable. I was going to say, because Nikes aren't cheap now, you know, 20 no. years ago. But uniform is, is a good way to put it. So that the black shirts and sweatpants, and they got the black and white sneakers, everybody's wearing the same thing, you know, and that came to uniform of how they would do things. So in the interviews with the cult members, they talk about 
you would make pancakes a certain way. You use the same amount of uh, pancake batter, use the same amount of syrup. Everybody had the same amount of everything. You'd make the pancakes in a certain way so everybody got identical. So the process was defined very specifically. Yes. And it had to be followed that way. And everything was like that. In fact, one of the guys talks about how you weren't supposed to shave up. For the men, so if you had to shave, you would shave a certain way. And everything was kind of decided for you. So you could control your behavior the best. Everything was a routine. Everything was very uniform. So they're all wearing the same kind of stuff. And they also had special patches made. Like, okay. m- like mission patches. Like astronaut patches. Like, well, they were exactly like astronaut patches. And in fact, they said Heaven's Gate away team. Well, I think it's funny that the uniforms were black when it's Heaven's Gate. Mm-hmm. You know, you just, you, when you hear heaven, you think, instantly you think of the, the white right. robes, not. <laughs> I think they just wanted black. it to be slim. They, like black is slimming, you know. <laughs> you want to look your best when you're going to go to the comet. So that away team, actually, that's a Star Trek term. So on Star Trek, they would always have away teams. And then the captain would say, get an away team ready. And usually Captain Kirk would go down with Mr. Spock and you'd have a couple of people with them in red shirts. Who would, and the, the guys in the red shirts would be killed by the, uh, the villain. And that's how you'd create some kind of sense of danger in the episode by killing off the quote unquote red shirts. So red shirts now is a term in science fiction when you have people, just a couple people show up to get killed. Sure. Like, oh, I'm wearing the red Aww. shirt. I'm going to die. And... But the away team was always the, the team that beamed down from the Enterprise onto the planet. So they used that terminology in their suicide mission, on their patches. So they had these patches made that said Heaven's Gate away team, and everybody had them on. And that's not the only place they used Star Trek terminology. There's a whole section of their book called like The Return of the Extraterrestrial. And it, they even say that we will use terms of science fiction so you will understand it better. And they talk about how like God is the admiral and then Jesus okay. is the captain. Well, and finding how, the common language. Right. And so the, you know, the admiral of Starfleet or whatever is God. And that was who was inside Bonnie Nettles. And the captain of Starfleet was Jesus. And that's who's inside uh, Marshall Applewhite. And, you know, and Bonnie and Marshall, you picture them like some kind of crazy power couple or something. But it's not sexual. It's not romantic. It's all focused around just a team. this religious business. and. They never were that apocalyptic. You know, they had their group based on how, you know, the Bible was just a, a story of extraterrestrials, and, and they didn't really start getting apocalyptic. It was never suicide until Bonnie dies in 1985. She gets cancer. Uh-huh. And, you know, she's like, she even has to have her eye removed because of the cancer. And she's like, well, I can't, you know, I'm, we're supposed to transcend, like, we're not supposed to die we were, we're supposed to transcend and just, we're going to be taken up. We're going to be assumed into the next level of human evolution. The next, no, the, I'm sorry, the next level beyond human. We're just going to become that. We're going to ascend to that. We're not going to have to die first. But then she dies. And so that's when the human individual metamorphosis, that's where it changes a little bit. And that's where it goes from. The only way to ascend is to die. So what year was that when she died? It was like in the 1985. Okay. So that's when the nature of the religion changes a little bit. I mean, they always, they always did have some kind of, they talked about the end of days and, you know, the, the UFO too, they said they were, you know, that they had witnessed the ending events of the Bible and that it was, you know, it was aliens, um, Luciferians against these, mm. against the good extraterrestrials. And so they have this entire cosmology about good and evil, and it's almost Scientologic. Like, like Scientology in how these aliens are battling over the souls of humans. But so when she dies, everything changes a little bit. And she was the one who really originated the idea with her astrology and whatnot, right? Right. So, I mean, so now that she's gone and she's not there to guide the original principles or whatever, right. it's kind of taken on its own life. Well, and the thing is, is that, you know, part of the uh, cosmology was that Earth was a garden, Okay, Earth was a garden designed to grow souls. And oh, that's nice. Yeah, that does nice. that does sound nice until <laughs> you know, we're getting near the year when two- it's time to harvest. Bingo. So, we're we're getting near the year 2000, and what was happening around the year 2000 is everybody gets this millennial fever. 
this end of days kind of feeling. And and you could see it in, in the TV shows at the time. I mean, Arnold Schwarzenegger has a movie called End of Days right. where the devil's going to come, you know, he's going to try to sacrifice somebody on December 31st, 1999. Um, even the Doctor Who TV movie in 1996 is all about December 31st, 1999, the end of the world happening then. Uh, everybody's worried about Y2K. And if you guys weren't around for Y2K, let's do a quick explanation of it. Because in <laughs> retrospect, it seems like the stupidest thing ever. But, but it was scary at the time. It was scary at the time. So the idea around Y2K is that because when people were developing computers, they used two digits for the year instead of four digits for the year. When it reset to zero on January 1st, 2000, when it, everything would go bonkers, all the, you know, the, the ghosts in the machine Computers would all would come reset, out. And like nuclear power plants would explode. And, <laughs> you know, people said they didn't know what was going to happen. So it was a widespread fear that things would malfunction and, and the world basically, because of all the computers controlling everything, mm-hmm. <laughs> the world would just go bonkers and power would go off and banks would you know everybody's money would be <laughs> empty out of their bank account <laughs> that happens the first episode of family guy there's a y2k joke nice like the first episode of family guy like peter ends up you know getting a bunker or whatever and so they all survive but then the rest of the world explodes because the nuclear bombs go off at midnight on january 30 <laughs> you know january 1st 2000 and also nbc has a whole miniseries called Y2K and what's, you know, what's going to happen after the, you know, the banking system shuts down coast to coast AM probably had a Y2K oh show my on gosh. every couple of weeks. There'd be a Y2K show and, you know, coast to coast also factors into this hail bop business. And one of the reasons that it factors in is now this is going to be, I'd say a month before the suicides happen. So, I mean, the idea was that, I mean, Hale Bop is discovered in like 1995 and it's actually discovered by like amateurs, like two different like amateur observers looking in there. Which is really cool. Yeah. I think somebody, one guy was in Arizona in his driveway and, you know, they sees this and then, right. And may, you look outside right now, maybe you'll see Hale Bop. But so they discover Hale Bop and the comet's going to be super close to the earth and we know it's going to be visible. And well... The people on coast to coast start, you know, start taking off. So um, this one specific uh, coast to coast guest was talking about how there was a companion object in the shadow of Hale Bob. Okay. So it's not just the comet, but there's something trailing the comet. And that's where people were saying. So at Heaven's Gate was, you know, that that was the UFO of Heaven's Gate was the, the companion object trailing the comet. And so, uh, like a month before, Coast to Coast is even talking about it. And so it makes you think, like, were some of these crazy theories, because some people were saying, like, it was all about Nabiru. Remember Nabiru, Planet X? Oh, yeah. That also this companion object was here, was part of the whole Nabiru conspiracy when Nabiru is going to come around again. And this, it was here to, like, announce the next coming of Nabiru. So this is what the kind of stuff that people are saying on Coast to Coast, which is obviously... There's no way of, you know, proving it at all. We verified there was no companion. And that's probably why the Heaven's Gate website still says there might not be a companion to hail Bop, but we still celebrate the fact that, you know, our, our alien friends are here to take us to the next level. And it does make you wonder, did Coast to Coast have something, you know, did that kind of hysteria, I mean, add to it, millennial hysteria. Yeah. I mean, Marsh Coast to Coast. I mean, they still do have like the the survival, you know, all the ads and everything. But oh yeah, I just remember the the uh, what was it the wave radio. <laughs> oh yeah, and like, all those ads for things that like would run without power and uh, just it, feeding into the the fears and the theories that things were going to go berserker and the world was going to be like post apocalyptic <laughs> kind of situation. Well, I don't know if you've ever listened to, uh, I don't even know if Glenn Beck still has a radio show. But even I'm not I, sure. And, you know, Glenn Beck's obviously very conservative, but he doesn't really usually err towards the conspiracy alien side of things. Right. But he would even have, like, I remember he'd talk about on his show sometimes, he'd be like, have you guys ever thought about food insurance? And they'd have, he'd have this long ad where he'd talk about, you know, if something happens, if the power grid goes down, if all these things happen, then you're going to want to have food for your family ready. 
And it was like army MREs meals ready to eat kind of thing that you would buy to prepare. So it's a whole doomsday prepper thing. Yeah. And I mean, coast to coast is always huge in that. And the late 90s, everybody, you know, the, the millennial fever was a thing. And people were feeling like the end of the world. I remember um, our friend Max. And Max is no religious guy or a, a dummy or anything like that. He's a, he's a surgeon. You know, he's a brilliant, brilliant person. But he, yes. I remember him telling me something. This is maybe 1997 or something. I remember him telling me, like, do you feel it? Do you ever feel like we're living, we're living at the end? And I'm like, what? No, I don't feel like we're living Stop at the that. end. I think, like, what are you talking about? You've been watching yeah. too many movies. Uh, we're not living at the, what do you mean? So this was just this general feeling. And if, and if you weren't around or you weren't aware of things back then, you kind of, it was a different, when people talk about the 70s and they talk about the gas crisis and how during that particular recession, life was really hard for a lot of different people. When people talk about that, you have this, you know, this idea in your head of how a lot of people felt. And so that's why I'm trying to get over that, that millennial feeling that something is going to change yeah. on December 31st, was, 1999. And it does make sense because it really was prevalent. It was every time you turn on the news or the radio or the TV shows, the movies, <laughs> everybody was talking about it constantly. It felt like, so I could see where it would, you know, pervade. Yeah. The end of the world was in people's heads. All the time. And so this is how the people of uh, the Heaven's Gate organization are feeling in the late 1990s. Marshall Applewhite, he's getting old. So he's getting, I mean, he's getting into his 70s. And he starts getting probably into the put up or shut up kind of thing. You know, he's had this organization now for 22 years. Yeah. I mean, some of these people were in the organization for 19 or 20 years. Some were brand new too. They were using the internet. So how they were making money is that they were designing websites. The, the webmaster. We, the webmaster. The webmaster called that Wendy. Friendly neighborhood webmaster. Was talking about. And there's a very interesting part of this BBC documentary where they talked to this guy that joined in the last six months. Him and his wife, they were living in Cincinnati. They had four kids oh. and they found the Heaven's Gate message over the web. And so they started, um, listen to me, I, talk, I said the web. I'm talking like it's the 1990s again. They found it over the World Wide Web and they used it using web crawler. Um, HTTP slash slash backslash. So uh, there's this black couple in Cincinnati and they leave their kids behind. All four kids, they leave them oh, with, na- they leave them with family members. Cool. They go Come to on. San Diego where the Heaven's Gate people are living in a $7,000 a month home. 9,200 square foot mansion located at 18241 Colina Norte. Now it's Paseo Victoria, uh, Rancho Santa Fe, San Diego area community, paying $7,000 a month for a 9,200 square foot mansion. So it's a pretty swank joint. And well, they go move. And this is six months before, you know, March of 1997. And then the guy like freaks out a little bit. He's like, well, this isn't what I wanted. I don't want to be part of this group. He tries to convince his wife to come home, and she won't. She loves it. Oh, no. She feels purpose, and she stays. The kids were just on their own at this point? Staying with, they gave them the family members. Okay. He said, yeah, he's like, yeah, we gave up our children, and we went to, we went to Cincinnati. And then he, (laughs) well, and the thing is, the the BBC documentary they made is only a year after everything happened. So this is very, Uh I mean, this this guy lost his wife, kids lost their mother, and he's just like, man, that's something I got to live with. But uh, so 9,200 square foot mansion and starting in, so March 19th and 20th, Marshall Applewhite tapes himself talking about how it's time to evacuate Earth. And the spacecraft trailing Hale Bop is going to pick them all up to take their souls to the level of existence beyond human. You know, here's something interesting too. I didn't know this. In October 1996, the group purchased alien abduction insurance to cover up to 50 members at a cost of $10,000. There is such a thing? As alien abduction insurance. There was in the 90s. I guess they were watching way too much X-Files. Unbelievable. And speaking of X-Files, okay, there's a spin-off. It's, we're talking about millennial fever. There's a spin-off of X-Files called Millennium. Called Millennium. All about the Millennium. Uh-huh. <laughs> and what's going to happen at the Millennium. Starring Lance Henriksen 
who we were talking about in the episode about Bill Paxton just a couple episodes ago. And so the idea that something's happening, something's going to happen. Do you ever feel like we're living at the end? No, (laughs) but okay. And so the week before it happens, March 26th is when they're eventually found. They all tape goodbye videos. And you can watch this on YouTube. Oh, um, you can, I don't know. That's... You know, it's not as sad as you think. I hate to say it like no. that. Like it's not, but everybody looks kind of, everybody's like, man, I can't wait. They're I, confident. I just can't wait to go to heaven. I can't wait to be the next level above human. I guess. I mean, it's like going on a big trip somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> the night before the trip, you're all <laughs> right. up. We're going to Disney World. Yeah. You know. and, and they think they're going to Disney World in the sky. Yeah. So all this happens. They go for their last meal. And so, Wendy... What was it? I have to ask. Well, I'll, I'll t- I'm going to tell you because they all had the same Please. thing. And they even ordered it in advance. If you could go to any restaurant for your last meal, where would it be? Oh, don't ask me that. Well, I'm just, I'm just saying, if you, if, if you just <sighs> pick your current favorite... So good places. So many good places. I don't know. I can't think of one right now. I, I, there's too many. Too many good ones. I would go back in time to this Asian buffet called Taste of Asia that was on the east side of Madison. <laughs> And I would go back in time and I'd stay there all day. So I just, I just wouldn't leave. So I'd be like, this is my last meal. I'm just going to eat. And it was one, it was the only time I ever went to an Asian buffet that just had a big bowl of peanut sauce in the middle of the, uh, so oh, you just, that sounds amazing. Yes. And their tofu was excellent and all the kind of stuff. And you could just dump as much peanut sauce as you wanted oh. on there. And everything was just very tasty. That's where I would go for my last meal. A good, solid choice. Thank you. You know where I wouldn't mm. go? Where? Marie Colander's. Uh- <laughs> Wait, she makes the chicken pot pies. I like those little things. Indeed, she does make the chicken pot pies. <laughs> and Marie Collender's is the place where they had their last supper. All right. The menu was set up ahead of time. Dinner salad. They all have the vinaigrette salad dressing. Iced tea. Oh, man. Turkey pot pie. So they did get the famous okay, pot. Yes. You called it. You called it. Yeah, they, they got the really good chicken pot pies. So good. It's the last thing you're ever going to eat. <laughs> I don't know if I'd go that far. <laughs> and then they all, okay, had, sure. they all had blueberry cheesecake for dessert. Oh, at least they indulged a little bit. I feel like the solid choice. Yeah. So what happens is they go back after their last meal. And over the course of three days, they all eventually kill themselves. And the thing is that Marshall Applewhite wasn't the last one. Like he wasn't some kind of mastermind that was using people to the end. He went like in the second wave or something. And you, they could tell he because... what he preached. <laughs> He did. And you could tell when they got there, when they got there, everybody was in different states of decomposition. So they took a mixture of alcohol, phenobarbital, hydrocodone, so barbiturates and alcohol. They washed it down with vodka. Also with a little bit of applesauce. So, I mean... Just for flavor? Yeah. But they always say, they always make that, you know, in, when we were kids in health class, whatever, they'd be like, barbiturates and alcohol, the deadly duo. And, yeah. and that's the thing. You don't, you don't mix downers with drinking or you, you end up like Heath Ledger or whatever and um, Brittany Murphy where it's like they, they're not trying to kill themselves and they don't even think they're drinking that much but they just took some kind of pill to probably help them sleep had a drink to go to bed and then you stop breathing and these guys assisted the stopping of breathing by putting their heads in plastic bags so they put the shoes on they put the outfits on they're wearing the Star Trek away, Heaven's Gate away team badges and uh, they put their heads in plastic bags and then they fell asleep and never woke up. And then the people that were still around would put a purple shroud over their body and leave them there. Mm-hmm. And so what happens is Richard Ford, uh, he renamed himself as Rio D'Angelo. Um, he was a member of the cult. And he talks to Doe a few months before the suicide. And he says he feels like he's got a different mission. He still believes, but he feels like he has a different mission than staying at the complex. And so Doe gives them the mission to take their message to the world, to do a press release, to do the thing. And he's the guy that finds the bodies, brings it to the attention of the police. And he says that the other people said they would leave the door open for him. What a job. Right? (laughs) That the other people said they would leave the door open for him so he could follow. But he doesn't get to follow. And, um... So he's still around, but he's acting like, in, you know, he's like, well, yeah, I'm happy for them because they're on the next level above human. And here's the weird thing. Okay. March 22nd, 1997. 
By the time you read this, we suspect that the human bodies we were wearing have been found, and that a flurry of fragmented reports have begun to hit the wire services. For those who want to know the facts, the following statement has been issued. Heaven's Gate, a way team, returns to level above human and distant space. By the time you read this, we'll be gone, several dozen of us. We came from the level above human and distant space, and we have now exited the bodies we were wearing for our earthly task to return to the world from whence we came. Task completed. The distant space we refer to is what your religious literature would call the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. It is a press release about their suicides. And that's the whole thing. Like that, they, wow. they send a press release out. They're filming goodbye videos. And everybody in the goodbye videos is like, yeah, we're going to, you know, next level stuff. Right. Like you said, we're going to Disney. Hey, you know, what are you going to do? You just, you just drank vodka and barbiturates. What are you going to do? I'm going to Disney World. <laughs> and so that's how, you know, they, they release this and that's how it goes. They all, they all died in waves over a course of a couple of days. And, um, and then the rest. knows? Maybe they are at the next level. Well, I'd like to think that would be nice if they ended up being at the next level. But also, you don't want to encourage people to kill themselves. No, of course not. <laughs> but I mean, it's it's a it's a very modern kind of cult. One that's influenced by everything from you know Star Wars. They they watched Star Wars at the complex all the yeah. time. Anything that would connect and them to aliens, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. They would they would watch those things, and that would reinforce their belief. And it almost seems like they had a sense of humor, you know, with the away team thing. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it's completely. And, and that's the surprising thing. When I wanted to talk about how they were very um, frank about everything, like even on their website, it says, here's our position against suicide. It says the true meaning of suicide is to turn against the next level when it's being offered. So their idea was that they weren't. Oh, they redefined what, an, what actually suicide is. Yeah. So it, they believed that if they had not gone on the, uh, the comet trip. Mm-hmm. They were missing their opportunity to continue to the next level and therefore ending their spiritual life. Right. And, you know, whether it's true or not, it certainly is kind of, I mean, it's such a modern kind of story because they take their influences right out of science fiction. Yeah. I mean, they, they, pop culture. I don't know if they're listening to Coast to Coast, but obviously they know about the companion or that weird UFO that's following Hale Bob. There's no UFO following Hale Bob, but they hear about it. And then that, that becomes into their literature as well. They have a website, you know, the website's still up. They took the Green Bay Packers logo. Like <laughs> all this, like Heaven's Gate 20 years later, like it's still, I think, a fascinating example of how spiritualism can, you know, spiritualism is a real positive thing. And I know we both have read a whole bunch of stuff and listened to seminars and things like that where you guys talk about like the difference between your soul and your yeah. body and don't get caught up in your, your, your soul and um, you know, that, that you can't always control yourself. And, you know, I mean, one of the things is that, like, is all this because, like, Marshall Applewhite felt, you know, he was conflicted in his own sexual urges and then has to create this whole system around it. And then eventually Who knows? 39 people die. But, well, you know, I Whatever was... Whatever it was, he must have been very convincing. Right. Oh, yeah. But, you I know, mean... the, the story doesn't end quite yet. Oh, so after I watched the original documentaries and read a, a couple of uh, long articles on the subject and did a whole bunch of research, I ended up finding a couple of more YouTube videos from people in like 2011, 2012. And one of them features Sawyer, who was one of uh, the Heaven's Gate disciples back in the... He was part of the organization from 1975 to 1994. And he, uh, you see him in every Heaven's Gate documentary because he's talking okay. about how he left... You know, how he left the organization, started a family, and he just, you know, he, he moved on. But then he says that he starts to have dreams about T and Doe and the other Heaven's Gate members. And he, oh, st- wow. he starts dreaming about them all the time. And he says that Doe now talks to him through his dreams. And okay. so that uh, Doe has asked him for service from the other side and still helping to spread the message about the level above human because now Doe is on the other side at the level above human and wants to continue the mission for the rest of the population. And that seems dangerous. Yeah. I mean, I just, I just thought it was really interesting that yeah. somebody who, you know, it's like he left the organization in 1994. Yeah. But yet he has never left. Huh. So it continues on. Right. The saga and, and continues. So, and how he, you know, 20 years ago, you have him in documentaries talking about like he's, you know, shocked and sad and all this kind of stuff. And 
it's like something that his mind can't get rid of. It's an obsession. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's understandable too. Such a wild tragedy. And I'm sure being close with those people and then losing them all and being the one that's continuing on. Right. It would definitely be in your thoughts all the time. If, if not your conscious, then in your subconscious when you're sleeping. Yeah, it's just got to mix you up a little bit. Yeah. Well, and, and uh, one last note. So you can check out those YouTube videos. We'll have some of the links. But it's just interesting. The Sawyer character came back and now he's like, Doe speaks to me still. And you're like, holy crap. Like, he sounded so reasonable 18 years ago. Yeah. So interesting enough. Now, this is, wow. from, this is from our ghost tour guide, Lisa in Madison. So hey, Lisa. Lisa Van B, and she's been on the podcast a few times. And, you know, I didn't think we were, we told her we were talking about Heaven's Gate. And I just, I mean, and I asked yeah, you. Yeah, I didn't mention it to her. No, and so I, I didn't think we told her about Heaven's Gate. So this morning, she just sends me a, a quick message. She's like, you know, one of the stops on the ghost tour is a connection to the Heaven's Gate cult. <laughs> the short story is there was a man living there when it was being built out to a restaurant. And he tried to ride his bicycle to California to catch up with them because he read about them on the internet. But he didn't make it before they killed themselves. Oh, that's a long bike ride. Yeah, so he, he bikes back to Wisconsin and then he kills himself in the basement. Aww. And so one of the owners, she had let him live there in the basement at the time. And he was a weird guy. And it says that the construction workers were all kind of freaked out by him. They all waited for each other to go in together because nobody wanted to be alone with him in the room. And well, the, wasn't that place previously a morgue? I don't, I, I don't know. I thought that was the story behind it, but I, I, I don't quote me on it. Well, if he killed himself in the morgue. An interesting choice for a place to live in the basement of <laughs> right. what was formerly <laughs> well, it a could, morgue. It could have been a morgue a long time ago or, and then converted to yeah. a residential on that, you know, because otherwise. Yeah, especially if there was construction going on or whatever. Otherwise, you kill yourself in the morgue, you just cut out the middleman. But the owner of the restaurant said he was sure that um, he wasn't haunting the place because he had a spaceship to catch. Oh, so that, I mean, and, and the owner is pretty serious about it. So that's just an interesting thing that Madison has his own little connection to uh, Heaven's that Gate. That is interesting. And that the person... And that Lisa sent it to you today. Then, right. And she's like, I hope that helps. So I, I don't know if I put out that vibe or maybe I sent a Facebook message I didn't remember, but it's not in my list. Huh. And I'm like, huh, how did she know we were working Cheers. on Heaven's Gate today? Maybe she thought it'd be interesting for the newsletter because this is that week, this is the 20th anniversary of the suicides. Maybe she thought, thought that Right, it's, yeah, it's been in the news a bit. But uh, just right. the well, funny thing is I get that message, I'd say a half an hour before. I'm like, oh, I got to Skype Wendy, we got to get on. And yeah. I'm like, oh, how did you know that? So Lisa, thank Whoa. you for reading our psychic call to you and, come, and bringing a Heaven's Gate Thanks, story. Thanks, Lisa. Anyway, so Heaven's Gate called 20 years, so I hope those souls got to go to the next level beyond human and that they didn't just die. But it's just a good lesson in, you know, belief is one thing, but, you know, be careful because you could be leaving a family behind. Well, belief and obsession and stuff like that are the themes behind our song Arthuriana. Mm, one of our favorites. Yeah, and so uh, we wrote and recorded this song a few years back, and it was about how people obsess over things and in the song it goes from uh, monty python to doctor who to uh king arthur obviously arthur and we talk about it um <laughs> but also uh, one of the lines is you're the comet of heaven's gate and uh, we realized like even after we thought about the topic like well we already talk about heaven's gate in the song <laughs> so it's a perfect opportunity to use it yeah and it's also an illustration of how pervasive that event was to pop culture that it's even <laughs> It's even in one of our own songs. Right. On a non-anniversary kind of, like, it was just something, yeah. you know, that we right. thought of when you thought about obsession. So here is Sunspot with Arthuriana. You are the sword. I am the stone. You are the lighthouse in the storm. Little obsession Surpass the time Arthuriana Arthuriana You are the lady Of the lake You are the comet Of heaven's gate Little obsession
feet of the angels I won't blink Little obsession that keeps us sane Arthuriana for listening to today's episode. You can find us online at othersidepodcast.com. Until next time, see you on the other side. Hey, 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 Mike. We had a really fun Patreon hangout this week. Oh, I did. I had a good time too. And we're going to do it again this month in April on the 20th of April. So Patreon members, put it on your calendar. We want to hang out with you. Absolutely. And we want to give a special shout out to who? Ned, Dr. Ned. Ned. Thanks, Doc. And everybody, uh, if you're interested in becoming part of the Patreon community, you can check that out at othersidepodcast.com slash donate and join us for some special hangouts where we talk about paranormal stuff and just sit around, drink wine, have fun and talk. It's uh, a good time. You know, and it's just a way to get to know everybody better also to learn about the kind of things that you are interested in and the kind of topics that we can talk about on See You on the Other Side. Doe, a deer, a female deer. Ray, a drop of golden sun.